I'm Asif. I'm a co-founder of Office Hours, where we do a lot of interview prep and recruiting for venture capital, private equity, and growth equity firms. Uh, and we love having different people on our webinars to talk about their investing roles and their paths into the buy side investing. Alex in particular has a phenomenal background. You know, he started his career in investment banking at Morgan Stanley and the technology group, later worked at Iconic where he did growth equity investing. And then he joined Advanced Venture Partners. And I actually worked at Advanced when I was doing private equity, but Alex joined there as a junior to mid-level investor, worked his way all the way up to partner. So we're super excited to have him and thanks for joining us, Alex. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for everything everyone in attendance today for, for taking the time. Awesome. So, you know, I wanted to structure this as a conversation and touch on three major topics. You know, I wanted to hear more about your background. I wanted to hear more about AVP in general. And then I also wanted to hear about the role that you guys are hiring for. And, you know, we can save some time at the end here for some Q&A, but I thought we could spend 20 or 30 minutes just you and I chatting and then save 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A if that works. That's perfect. Let's dive in. Awesome. So Alex, we'd love to hear more about your background. How did you first break into banking? Yeah, great question. It seems like so long ago. I'm Alex Christ. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa in the Midwest, attended the University of Iowa, double majored in finance and accounting. And as maybe a lot of you on this call, being from a non-target, the path into investment banking was non-linear and sort of required a lot of hustle and lining things up to increase the probability of success and in breaking into the industry. So I'll touch on my experience a little bit. So uh, when I was in school and I knew I wanted to go into banking and wanted to pursue that as my career first job out of college, I basically had three goals that were subsets of each other. So one was just to break into banking. Two was to get to the coast and either be in New York City at an investment bank or in San Francisco. And three, in a perfect world, everything lines up, have the opportunity to be in a tech group. I was fortunate. As I thought about those things, I realized there were two things I needed to get down, done really well. One, I had to be the best interviewer that I could be and practice as much as possible and sort of not have any excuse for not being prepared for things. And two, had to network and create opportunities the best that I could. We were really fortunate in Iowa. We've got a dedicated organization within the business school that both helps students prep and prepare to get into the investment banking career path and also manages our alumni network, which had been a, continues to be at the school of a phenomenal and amazing resource and really spent a couple years doing two things. One, becoming the best interviewer that I could be. A lot of late nights with my friends who also went into banking in our business school, doing mock interviews, doing all those sort of things that I'm sure a lot of folks on this call remember quite well or are going through right now as well. And then I think the second thing, the most important thing was doing as much networking as I can to break in the door and, and have the opportunity to interview with groups and with investment banks that sort of fit to the three goals that I outlined. And, you know, Iowa had a great alumni network in Chicago, a little less built out alumni network on the coast and where I wanted to be. But, you know, my strategy was always, you know, meet who was in the network, leave a good impression, ask good questions, and but also be really direct in terms of in, honest about like where I wanted to be and uh, that I wanted to be out on the coast and in a tech group if possible. And I think, you know, people were great about sort of making that next introduction so I could continue sort of maximizing the chance to have interview conversations. I ended up recruiting for my junior internship, you know, was fortunate enough to receive a number of offers at, at Bulge Bracket Banks through that process, and including Goldman in New York, and then Morgan Stanley in their tech group down on Sand Hill Road out here in the Bay Area. And, you know, given all of my goals, this was 2011, you know, this was sort of the beginning of the, you know, the 2010 software market. It, it was sort of a no-brainer for me to go to Morgan Stanley and have the chance to be in their tech group. So was a summer analyst, was fortunate enough to earn a return offer, and started in 2012 as an analyst there and, and was able to sort of realize the school of breaking into banking. That's awesome. It's really impressive that, you know, from Iowa, which traditionally doesn't have on-campus recruiting, you're able to break into and receive offers at two of the top tech groups on the street, which must have required a ton of hustle and prep work. But just goes to show, you know, if you put in the work, a lot of great goals are possible for sure. And, you know, as someone with a banking background as well, I think it's a phenomenal place to kind of hone in a skill set. You know, at 21, 22 years old, you're working on all these transactions, you're doing so much deal experience, financial modeling, but you're also interfacing with very senior people, which I think sets you up really well to do a career, whether it's in 
private equity, venture capital, or even in corporate. So, you know, that being said, what led you to go to your next role at Iconic and pursue VC and growth equity versus, you know, a lot of people will pursue private equity or different roles? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, you know, I'll echo on what you said. I think, you know, nowadays there's a lot of different opportunities for people coming out of school, but I still think the banking route is amazing. You learn a lot of hard skills, you learn a lot of soft skills, and I think the prep it gives you to then be able to go a bunch of different ways in your career afterwards is still amazing, you know, as the world continues to change and industries continue to evolve. So I spent two years in Morgan Stanley. Our group was sort of, at least at the time, it was two years and out. There wasn't a lot of promotion internally. So you put in two years of hard work and then you go into private equity or growth or become an operator. And so I started out exploring a bunch of different industries, like a lot of folks in banking, thinking about private equity and public market investing and venture and growth. And as I continue to learn more and sort of have conversations with people, People in the space, venture and growth really stuck out to me in terms of a fit for what I felt like was exciting. And for me personally, I feel like private market investing at that earlier stage in venture and growth is really intellectually stimulating for what I think is interesting, where I thought my think my skill set is. And what I mean by that is I think companies at that stage, the diligence you do and what you have to learn is kind of this perfect mix of qualitative and quantitative analysis. And I love that. You know, the companies aren't so early. They're not seed stage businesses where you're just betting on a founder and idea. They're not large public companies or large or later end growth stage companies where, you know, even though founder and qualitative aspects matter. A lot of it, this is quantitative and sort of skewed towards that side of things. You know, when you're a series A, a series B company, it's about looking at all of those different factors, whether it's unit economics and financial performance on the qualitative side to competitive landscape, founder quality, management team quality on the the qualitative side and, and being able to like for every different company, it's a little bit different and having the challenge of being able to weight all of those different things and figure out whether you can get comfortable to want to make an investment. And so I was fortunate enough, once I found that area to be the place I wanted to go into after banking, I received an offer and joined Iconic Capital in their very early days. So I was the sixth person on the team. I know they've grown and you know what they've done there over the last decade or so has been incredible. You know, there were two partners at the time. I was the fourth associate. There was no one in the middle. It was a great experience just because we were running at a bunch of different things, investing not only in software, but a, a number of different asset classes. And I think I was there a little over a year, but I think I learned as much in a year there as I did in, in two years of banking, if not way more. You know, the team there is fantastic and I'm sure everyone sees their name all the time in headlines and investment summaries today. You know, I, I might go a step further from your question. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, about a year into Iconic, having a great experience, and was fortunate enough through connections to meet my two colleagues who started AVP in 2015. I met them right as they were starting the fund, looking for their first junior investor, first member of the team, and loved the, you know, sort of the unique aspect of the capital, which I know we're going to get to in a little bit, and, and sort of the opportunity to be part of a small from day one and made the jump there. So joined AVP in 2015. And as Asif mentioned, you know, have been fortunate enough to, you know, grow through the ranks and, you know, be brought in to the partnership last year. That's awesome. That's amazing. It's a super quick trajectory to partner on your end. So very impressive. And just wanted to touch on, you know, post-banking when you evaluated VC and growth, and you mentioned it was a mix of qualitative and quantitative analysis. And, you know, I just wanted to echo those sentiments, right? Because I worked in traditional buyout private equity, and I also worked on the growth side as well. And I can tell you, uh, buyout private equity is very different from growth. It's so financial engineering heavy. You're buying all these super mature companies that have proven business models. They have all this cash flow. And so there's a lot of numbers to analyze, right? Starting with revenue, going down to through the COGS, through the OPEX, getting down to EBITDA, getting down to cash flow. There's every single line item you could do hundreds of analyses for. And so when you buy these companies, they're not growing 100% a year. They're already mature. And so when you buy them, you, you put the debt on them, you do all this rigorous financial analyses, and you generate this return. On the complete other end of the spectrum, on venture capital, there's absolutely no numbers at all sometimes. There might not be a product, there might not be revenue, there might be just two people in a garage. And I wanted to touch on why you went specifically towards this later stage venture and growth, which you said is a mix of right in between that qualitative and quantitative analysis. It's not rigorous line item manipulation and it's not just investing in ideas. So can you touch a little bit more on the growth side of things and what makes that unique? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like what I think is unique at that stage and why I was excited about going into that industry after investment banking was it is that mix of competencies that you're trying to evaluate in an investment. Me personally, I'm not an operator. I don't know if I could get comfortable just doing a bunch of early seed stage meetings and trying to see 15 years down the line of what a business is going to look like without a lot of numbers. I like numbers. I like data. I'm a data driven person and a data driven decision maker. But to your point, Asif, like also wasn't interested in that being the only focus of my job and like you might have in private equity or in the public markets. And so what I, you know, what I think is really exciting about growth is you've got these businesses that have proven business models, have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. And so you can look at data all day. You can look at the models, the unit economics, all of those sort of things, but it's not the only part of the answer because these businesses, they, they haven't gotten to their end game. They haven't gotten to the exit either. And other things matter, whether it's competitive landscape, whether it's TAM, whether it's the ability of the founders to hire and upgrade their management team at the right time and in the right way. I think it's that combination of you needing to, there, there being a bunch of different boxes you have to get comfortable with, and they're all different things that I think is exciting about growth. And it's not going to be the right thing for everyone. I think there's some people, some of my smartest friends are PE and hedge fund folks who just love to be in the numbers all day. And some of my other friends who I think are incredible are they're picking out seed stage founders all day. But I think this for the right person, if you like a little bit of both of that, late stage venture and growth tend to be, uh, I think is a, a perfect asset class. Awesome. I tend to agree. I think it's a phenomenal place to invest in. And, you know, that brings me to my next question. I would love to talk more about AVP and your type of investment style. So maybe just to start, what makes AVP unique? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm excited to talk about the fun. So I'll sort of focus on one of the, the qualities that I think makes us unique relative to a lot of other funds out there. And to see if you know a bit about this, having been in advance, but AVP is our capital is evergreen and it's evergreen because we have one long-term single limited partner that we partnered with since day one and have continued to be our sole capital partner throughout the life of ABP and well into the future. So that LP is under your old family held holding company in New York called Advance where Steve worked for he started office hours. It's a really incredible business. So it's a multi-generational multi-billion dollar group of operators who over the generations have invested in, operated and grown really iconic media and technology companies. You guys, anyone on the call can go check out their website, but today the assets include Condé Nast in the media space. It includes stakes in some of the biggest cable operators and content producers in the United States and in the world. It includes Reddit, the social network. It includes Iron Man if you are into triathlons, and it includes Turnitin.com that you everyone probably had to deal with back in college and while they were in school. And that's an incredible organization. And what they're really good at is long-term operating a concentrated set of companies that they own, either a large portion of or own outright and scale over a very long time. Where we came into play is in 2015, as we were starting AVP, we partnered with advance to be their exposure into venture and growth investments and the verticals around this space. So they've got a massive amount of capital in the holding company. A lot of it's concentrated in sort of long-term and long-held assets, but they saw the opportunity to take some of that capital and diversify it, get exposure to this really exciting asset class in sort of the tech space and tech enabled space in general. You know, what I'd say is unique, unlike other funds that may have concentrated capital is that we're set up like a traditional fund. So we've got a fund structure. We have committed capital from advance. We are financial returns driven. So our goal is to find great founders that we can partner with and generate long-term returns on our capital rather than be strategic capital. And we make decisions and can move as quickly as traditional funds. So we look like a normal venture capital or growth fund to the founders that we back. Our investment committee is our partnership plus a few members of the, the family group of the holding company. And we're able to move quickly, make decisions and be very nimble. And Alex, but, I just want to uh, jump in here for a second. Yeah, so, cool. absolutely. Just to appreciate the significance of that, you know, it's like you have this one LP, which is, you know, advance yeah. and advance operates billions of dollars of companies. And they have like large stakes in public companies like charter. They have 
outright ownerships in large private companies like Turnitin, which you know yep. we acquired for around $2 billion a couple of years ago. And then they realized back in 2015 when AVP started is that they want more exposure to the venture side of things. Yep. And that is specifically, AVP is a dedicated venture fund that is funded by Advance, but it is completely standalone and returns driven. So you're not really investing in companies from a strategic angle. It's not a corporate venture capital firm. It is a returns oriented standalone venture capital fund. Do I have that right? Exactly. So we don't have to get buy-in from a business group to do a deal. We don't have to check the box from a strategic angle. We're really thought of as a way to take some of the organization and advance as capital and put it into these venture and growth stage businesses to generate attractive returns. I'd say what's been really exciting for us with this structure in terms of, in addition to having a really close partner who's been amazing is also that they've got a very long-term outlook and they're very stable capital. So we, a few things in that we don't have to fundraise, which is amazing. We get to spend all of our time being investors, which I think similar to founders not loving to fundraise. I don't think there's a lot of investors out there who love to fundraise and love to be able to focus as much of their time on making great investments investments and partnering with great founder. And I think it's also as, especially as everyone knows, the venture market has experienced some shocks in the last year or so as valuations have changed, as the, val the market environment has changed and having that stable capital base that doesn't have to be as reactive to those market dynamics, I think is an advantage as we go into the next couple of years where I think the venture market will be not the same as it was two years ago with all the frothiness of 2021. Totally. It's a huge advantage to not have to be worried about fundraising, especially during market cycles. You know, everyone's talking about an impending recession, inflation and interest being so high, a flight of capital into various asset classes, and maybe venture will get hit. But, you know, you all don't have to worry about that at all. And, you know, similarly, your portfolio companies benefit from this because they're not worried about the venture fund level reallocation of capital or, you know, austerity measures for the sake of austerity measures. You guys have long-term strategic capital that you can provide to these portfolio companies and support them along their journeys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the last thing I might mention is because we have one, uh, because Advance has been fantastic, they're long-term focused. We don't have the pressure to deploy capital in the way that I think traditional funds do. Like, you know, we want to make great investments. We want to do our target number of deals every year, but we don't have to deploy capital so we can get to our next fund. We don't have to get markups on investments on paper so we can go market those to outside LPs or outside conversations. I think the structure has allowed us to do something really pure, which is just find great founders and back them and be really thoughtful around helping them achieve their goals and the visions of their companies. Amazing. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the fund structure. Would love to hear more about the actual investing style. Can we talk about what types of deals you all invest in, tech sizes, company stages, and so on and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. And so maybe I'll talk about the tactical stuff a little bit first. So uh, the way I would describe us is we're almost sort of like late stage growth or private equity in terms of capital concentration. Meaning our goal is, and we target doing two to four new investments a year. So it's not 10 or 15 investments. Our mantra is one good deal per person per year. And instead of having as many logos as possible, be able to take meaningful stakes in each one of those businesses, we try to lead or co-lead most of the, the the financings and investments that we make. And so it's it's a much more sort of concentrated, high conviction strategy than the other strategies out there in the market. What that means for us, since we're sort of highly concentrated, is we have a lot of flexibility in terms of when we invest in a company, what stage they're at, a bunch of these other dynamics. We try to write initial checks of 10 to 25 million. At that point, we feel like it's enough capital given the number of investments that we're doing a year where we feel like we're putting enough money to work at each investment. And our goal sort of on a yearly basis is somewhere between 75 and $125 million of capital deployed. From a stage perspective, we are not tied down to one stage. We don't have ARR or revenue targets on the minimum or the maximum side. We don't have stage requirements, but where we end up playing it primarily is leading or co-leading series A, B, or C rounds. That's where that 10 to $25 million check is typically a lead check. We can do larger deals if it makes sense. And we have historically on sort of one-off basis. The only place we won't do in sort of our minimum threshold is we won't invest in pre-revenue businesses. And what we typically look for are businesses who have generated enough revenue that you 
see at least initial product market fit or product market fit within the first product or customer vertical. And there are some proof points in data around go-to-market dynamics, go-to-market strategy, customer performance. And every company is a little different, but for us, that's sort of anywhere between one and $3 million of revenue or ARR run rate on the low end, which again means that it's probably not a seed round where we're investing is probably on the earliest a series A where we feel like we see enough data and the round sort of the right dynamics for us to deploy at least that 10 million. Totally. So in terms of the check sizes, in terms of the company stages, we've covered that. Are there any specific sectors that are particularly interesting to you at this time or any deals that you might want to address and let the audience know uh, to give an example of where you invest? Yeah, absolutely. So our strategy, given we're a small team, we're four people, we're hoping to grow to five early this year. We don't have any mandates in terms of spaces or business models we have to invest in. And we've got the flexibility. If you look at our portfolio, we've invested across a lot of different things, SaaS, business models, marketplace business models, ad tech business models, also a bunch of different verticals as well. But what we've realized, especially over the last few years, is as a small team, it's hard to be in every industry. It's hard to look at everything at once and be able to be a really thoughtful investor who can get in front of the best founders and the best opportunities. And so we probably spend 80% of our time, each of us focused on one industry. And the idea is from an outbound, we'll still look at things inbound in a bunch of different industries when they come in from our network or they seem really exciting. But in terms of being proactive and in terms of prioritizing where we spend time, it's focused on a few different sectors. And the commonalities of those sectors is they typically are large verticals where we feel like we can do a number of non-competitive investments. And in their verticals that have interesting sort of long-term tailwinds that we think we can take advantage of. And, and we think that the value of being vertical focused, at least with a large portion of our time, is we can get into those spaces, we can learn about what matters in the spaces, we can learn about the metrics that matter, and we can also do deals and sort of build our brand within each one of those verticals as a fund in a thoughtful manner. The spaces we're, in, we're primarily focused on right now are, are sort of four spaces. One is digital health. Two is insure tech. Three is applied data systems and platforms within the software vertical. And the fourth is fintech, especially around sort of wealth tech and the democratization of, of assets. A quick example, Asif, is one of our investments uh, at the beginning of COVID was in a business called Headspace in the behavioral health, digital behavioral health, mental health vertical. 18 months ago, we merged with Headspace to create Headspace Health. And that was us. We had already been spending a lot of time in digital health even before COVID, saw a lot of the trends of sort of the move to digital and to online care. As we realize as the cost of care goes up, as their mental health specifically, there's only so many sort of coaches and therapists out there and access to that care was really, really tough. And that was one where not to go into too much detail, but you know, we're able to form a relationship with the founding team and the investors around the table there. And right as COVID hit, we sort of looked at businesses that would be able to take advantage of long-term sustainable tailwinds in the industry and, and mental health, especially when we're all locked down in 2020, was top of mind for us and ended up doing a lot of due diligence in the business and what this was going to look like once we were out of the pandemic and got really excited about the opportunity and made the investment. But that was, again, us having spent time in digital health, looked at the landscape and sort of drilled down from a top-down market perspective into a business in a team that we were really excited about. That's awesome. I use Headspace all the time. So amazing kind of opportunity there, especially during the COVID conditions. Absolutely. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. So I wanted to talk more about the associate role at AVP and also open up the floor to questions. We've already gotten some great questions already in the chat. So just want to encourage everyone in the audience, feel free to ask questions via the Q&A button on the Zoom. We can start going through those sequentially. But in the meantime, why don't we talk about the associate role? You all are hiring right now. You're expanding the team. You all are deploying, you know, 75 to $125 million a year in series A, B, and C companies across those four verticals you mentioned, all kind of touching technology. So I'm sure a lot of people are curious, what does the associate role actually look like at AVP? And, and what are the responsibilities of these associates? Yeah, i really excited to talk about the role. And the most exciting part of this year is the opportunity to expand the team and continue to grow the organization. So, you know, we're a really small team. And I think 
what's unique about that, and I having have been in that seat myself, is that what I think you could see this at some other venture firms too. But when you're a smaller team, I think the opportunity you get is the the ability to wear a bunch of different hats. The role is multi-dimensional. It's not you're just doing due diligence. It's not just doing sourcing. It's the ability to wear a bunch of different hats and get a really well-rounded experience. The other thing I'll mention quickly is. Given we're such a small team, I think a great thing that we build is we're very low ego. We're all willing to roll up our sleeves. I, even though I'm a partner now, still do associate and VP and principal things and office manager things every day. Our managing partner, David, who started the fund after leaving TPG Growth, still gets into Excel documents. Like there's no sort of ego or a hierarchical structure that I feel like can sometimes be at different funds or at bigger organizations. Quickly touching on the role, I'd say the primary and where the associates spend most of their time is deal execution and really being the quarterback for helping us evaluate and helping AVP evaluate target opportunities for companies that are fundraising. So, you know, that, I think that's everything that you expect of a typical associate role, which is doing the analysis, helping draft the investment memo. But I would say it's other thing as well. We don't have VPs, we don't have principals. So the associate is the quarterback for that deal. They get exposure to the management teams. We expect them to be interfacing with the CEOs and helping run due diligence meetings, making sure that we're touching on all of the due diligence topics that we need to get done in the investment due diligence time frame. And so I think it's a lot more holistic than saying, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z in every deal. It's really the ability to have a lot of responsibility and ownership on our deal processes and also have a voice and be able to say, you know, we look to everyone on the deal, on our team, whether you're the most junior or the most senior, to say, have a voice and give a view on these opportunities and ask challenging questions to each other as we attempt to make the right decisions for where we want to deploy capital. So that's probably, that's the largest portion in sort of the, the first place where we expect associates to spend time. The second place is everyone's sourcing at AVP. We're not a firm that has a quota. You don't have to make a certain number of calls. You don't have to make, send out a certain number of emails, but we're not also running due diligence all the time. So when you have free time during the day or during the week, I think as long as you don't have other projects, I think the expectation is that you're finding interesting opportunities and in networking and going to conferences and creating, building the top of funnel for investments. And I'd say very similar to the rest of us. You know, we just had an associate join last year and we said, hey, what's a vertical you're excited about? that you want to go learn at, that you want your 80% of your outbound time to be. And we looked toward, we would do a similar thing with the person joining the team, which is, hey, this is the opportunity to sort of be thoughtful, have a space you're excited about and dive in in this proactive way that I was talking about earlier. And then finally, like a lot of smaller funds, there's real opportunity to be involved with the portfolio. We, the opportunity to be a board observer, the opportunity to do one-off projects and really build relationships with our management team, as well as I think in internal projects in standard sort of stuff that you might do at any fund. Awesome. No, it's really good. Across the due diligence, the sourcing and the portfolio work, I think you covered a lot of what the associates' expectations are. And I see Andrew had a question about you know, what, what is the interaction with associates with Portcos and you address that too, or, you know, you're directly interacting with the CEOs, you're directly interacting with the portfolio companies. So that's all great. Uh, we did have a question from Micah about, you know, does Advance actually leverage some of its other companies like Condé Nast for the investment work or for the portfolio companies. So maybe can you talk about uh, the extent which the holding company affects the venture investments, if at all? Yeah, absolutely. And so the way we're structured is, is it's sort of, it's a two-way sort of relationship. And so I mentioned earlier, we're set up to be a financial returns driven organization. We're not strategic. So there aren't people coming to us and saying, hey, you need to go invest in this or you need to go spend time in these spaces. So the double-edged sword is we can't go to the holding companies and say, you need to do this for us. You need to do that for us. But the fortunate thing that we have is because we're investing on behalf of the family group and the holding company layer in advance is we've got the ability to sort of build, get introductions and build relationships with folks in those operating businesses. And whether that's for due diligence or potential commercial relationships or potential advisor roles after we make investments, we've got the ability to sort of network and make introductions and do those things within the holding company. But it's a little more, it's not like a traditional corporate venture firm where you can just send someone an email and you've got the power to like make them do something. It's a bit more relationship building, but we've done that in a bunch of different ways throughout as we made investments. The great thing about Advance is there's so many different holding companies with different verticals, different challenges, different teams that I think there's just an incredible wealth of really thoughtful people who've 
seen and solved different product problems and have different perspectives on the world. But that's really unique rather than just being maybe attached to like just one org- one company or one business. Awesome. I think that's super helpful and addresses the question. Uh, we're getting a lot of more questions about the associate <laughs> role in general. So, you know, in the interest of time, what I wanted to ask you is what do you actually look for in associates and what are the qualities of a successful associate? But some other questions that we're getting in are kind of about, let's see here, you know, what is the timeline of an associate for title? What is this like a two and out program and when, what happens after the associate role? I'm getting some questions about the location and whether you consider sponsoring visas and so on and so forth. So maybe we would just start with what makes a good associate and then we can dive into the specifics. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a few things that qualities that we look for that we think are important for to be a successful associate and to really grow in part of a small team. And so I think the first thing that we look for is like, I'll describe it in a few ways. Like you need to have a personality of being self-driven. You need to have sort of the hustle mentality, the roll up your sleeves attitude, the sort of low ego attitude that I think is important for a really small team. I think, and why that is, is because I think as an organization, and I think a lot of smaller venture funds in terms of headcount are like, the job is sort of collaboratively independent. You're spending a lot of time talking together, working through ideas in meetings, but you also have a lot of time where you're running at things by yourself and you've got to have that sort of level of responsibility, that level of time management, that level of hustle to thrive in that unstructured role. Unlike banking, where you might come in and someone's going to tell you what you're going to do every day in venture as an associate, your days are not going to be structured. Your weeks are not going to be structured. You know what you need to do generally when you need to sync up with people, but it, part of your expectation is you're making great use of your time and you're being thoughtful and you're pushing things forward. You're knowing when to reach out and have conversations. And I think that's the thing I'll always make clear with people is you have to like crave be like that self-driven opportunity that unstructured men that unstructured environment i think there's a lot of smart people that need structure and like they might not be as suited for venture capital but i think that's the most important thing other than that like i think having a genuine curiosity in this space is so important. This job, whether you're associate or a principal or a partner is what you make of it. And I think it is what you make of it. Like those people love this job. Like they get up, like excited to talk to founders and companies. They want to ask that next question and due diligence that helps them learn about the business and gives them more insight into the space. And I think that's so important. I think one of the last things is great communication skills both in terms of being able to communicate effectively internally and externally, but also communicate in terms of how deals are going, communicating workload and responsibilities to your team. I think everyone on the team is a both a, a partner within the firm and someone external to the firm and having great skills in that from that perspective are is super important. And then the last thing I'll sort of add is we look for people with great qualitative and quantitative skills. As we were talking about at the very beginning, this is a job where your like, due diligence you're doing is multidimensional. And we realize that we're looking for that raw sort of skill set, that raw ability that we can train and mold and help you develop and mentor you over time. So I'll stop there. Cool. No, but th- that's a handful of things that we really look for during this process. Awesome. Alex, do you have five to 10 minutes to answer some of the questions from the audience? Yeah, oh, let's awesome. do it. So thank you everyone for the questions and the time. Some great questions here for sure. And I just wanted to comment on the description of the associate role that you mentioned. I do think when you say you have to be a self-starter, very curious, and just like dive into opportunities yourself, that's very different from banking, where you're just kind of executing. Like yeah. there's a very defined universe of tasks. You're just listening to orders from the associate, the VP, the managing director in banking. But in VC, it's not like that. You have to be very open-ended. You have to be proactive and bring ideas about which verticals you should go into and so on and so forth. So it is a little more, it's a daunting in some, some sense, drink from the fire hose and like actually becoming a real investor rather than just a banker who's following orders, right? Absolutely. Uh, but I think it's so invigorating because the amount of responsibility and ownership you get on things is so much higher than what you might get in banking just because there is the need for everyone to be wearing a bunch of different hats and playing a bunch of different roles. Every day, you're going to have your partner hat on, your principal hat on, and your associate hat on. And I think that's great for the right person who's excited about that. Cool. So maybe we can rapid fire some of these questions from the audience. So I'll just point and shoot. Ready? Go. So typical track and timeline for an associate in terms of title. You mentioned for the right opportunity, there is promotion opportunity, but why don't we answer that really quick? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we view this role as a, like in a typical initial associate role. So a two year commitment on the team, but there's absolutely the opportunity to continue along the career path and get promoted and go from, it's not a given. It is a, something you have to earn and you have to prove over during the two years of being an associate, but it's absolutely there. You know, case in point is me. I started as associate and worked my way up to partner and we are a small enough team. And as we think about team building over the next five or 10 years, we'd love for the next partner on the team. You know, we're never going to be a team of like 10 or 20 people. I think we're always going to be small, but you know, we'd love for the next partner on our team to be someone who starts as the associate and works their way up. But hopefully that answers the question. Totally. All right. Next one here. You do typically lead the investments from series A, B, and C. Does ABP typically require board seats for the investments? Typically, yes. It's not a hundred percent requirement. And there are investments that we've done where we are the co-lead or a fall on check where we don't take a board seat. But, you know, part of what I talked about earlier, having a concentration of investments, only doing a couple investments a year is because we like to be active. We like to be value add. We like to work with our portfolio companies. And I think having the board seat and being able to sit in that role is valuable to have when that's your strategy. So I'd say 80% of the deals we do, we like to have the board seat, but it's not an absolute requirement. Awesome. That's great. I mean, it really shows how closely you work with the port coast. If you lead the deals, take the board seats, more of an active investor with the portfolio company than passive investing. Absolutely. Logistical question, location preferences. This is a San Francisco based role in office. So you have to be in San Francisco. Maybe you can talk more about that. And also do you guys sponsor visas? Yeah, great question. So as you mentioned, this is the whole team's based in San Francisco, uh, X one partner who's on the East coast. We are, we've got an office in downtown union square and we are back in the office us four to five days a week. So whoever joins our team, if they're not in the Bay Area, the expectation is that they'll relocate and, and be in the office with us. And I think that as we w went through COVID and things started to get a little bit back to normal, we've realized the importance of being in the office as much as we can, just having the organic conversations, being able to be collaborative. We've got a fun office in Union Square. We're a small team. We go out to lunch quite a few times a month. Our managing partner is in the office down the hall and we're a small team. You don't have to schedule time to go talk to him. You can pop in and talk about deals or talk about the Premier League or whatever else you want to talk about. And so I think, but it is important to us that at least a good portion of the week we're back together collaborating in person. On visas for the right person, absolutely. We've not had sponsor visa uh, historically, but it's not necessarily a blocker for us. So definitely not a no for candidates who might require that. Awesome. And the partner you mentioned is David, right? He used to lead TPG growth before coming over to ABP. And you're saying that you just go talk to him whenever you want as an associate. That's pretty cool. Yeah, like we're, again, we're pretty low ego and we're a pretty small team. So he's in the office every single day too. Like it's not just the expectation that the associates are here in person. We're all together. And I think we realized that I think we built a great culture of both working hard to find great investments, but also to your point of see after this call, I'm going to go walk over and hang out with him and talk about deals, talk about life, things like that. And I think the approachability of the team and the culture set from the top down with David and the rest of the team is really phenomenal. It's one of the reasons that I've been here for so long is I think we built a great team with a great culture amongst the four of us so far. Awesome. I have a question here about mentorship. I think it follows along the same lines. How does AVP mentor associates to become the best investors they can be? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say I would maybe break it into two categories there. And I'd say the first thing is we are a very much a hands-on experience group. So I think you're going to get a lot of opportunity to step up into the role very quickly, leading meetings, working with portfolio company founders, having these real experiences. You as an associate, you're going to be in the room as we think about drafting term sheets and going through legal analysis, things like that. So I think the hands-on experience and the ability to like do things sooner rather than later is really important to people's growth, at least I think personally. And I think the other thing is we realized that we're a small team and that mentorship and sort of hands-on coaching is really important. So I think all of us from myself to our managing partner, we always take the time to teach people different skills 
to give them feedback on, on what they're doing. And I think we've got the capacity and the time and the desire to make sure every person on the team is growing and learning and building their skill sets. I think the other thing is we're also a team that's pretty transparent in terms of feedback. So it's not hard for you to know what you're doing a great job at. And we're also not afraid. And I think amongst all of us to say, hey, like maybe you could do a better job at this or let me help you think about how to do this better. And so I think both from the experience and the desire to provide feedback and teach, we have a lot of that there. And, and speaking as an associate or speaking as someone who started as an associate, I think everything I just sort of echoed on with it were things that I, you know, mm -hmm. got a lot of value from as uh, from my partners, from the other partners as I grew and developed. Totally. I mean, look, Office Hours run a mentorship and coaching company. So this is a super important question to me as well. And I can tell you that investing is an apprenticeship role. You can read yep. all the books you want about investing from the Warren Buffett's of the world all the way to, you know, <laughs> your deals. But if you don't have an experienced investor telling you about his or her war stories and like prior investments, successes, failures, so on and so forth, you're not going to really learn and internalize what investing is. So it's just so critical that you have an open dialogue with experienced and seasoned investors at, at all times, which it sounds like APP provides. Absolutely. Cool. I'm getting a lot of questions too about like the diligence process and the IC, specifically what percentage of the job is kind of data analysis and modeling versus, you know, sourcing and self-driven work. And I'm also getting some questions since, you know, you invest across multiple industries. How do you kind of approach the diligence process? So maybe we boil that down into what is your diligence process from seeing a deal to going to IC? And then what does your IC process look like? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So our deal teams are pretty small. So it's usually a partner and an associate. And again, the opportunity is not just doing due diligence and like cranking out the analysis, but it's, it's being thoughtful and holistic and quarterbacking the deal processes. I'll touch on one thing. You also said, which is, I think the primary focus of the role is to assist with due diligence, be the quarterback on uh, deal opportunities. Sometimes that's going to be 100% of your week. Sometimes that's going to be 0% of your week, and you're going to be spending the entire week sourcing at conferences and working with portfolio companies. So I think there's no sort of hard and fast rule because there are a bunch of different hats to wear. But the sort of expectation and the design is when there is a due diligence opportunity, you're grabbing that workflow and being the leader there. Our due diligence process is very fluid. We don't have like an investment committee go, no go meeting like a lot of funds do where we're working for like a month and then it's either red or green uh, at the end of the period. It's much more sort of collaborative. So we've got an investment committee meeting every week and we have other catch-ups just among the investment team every week. And it's a bit more of sharing data and analysis live with each other than just creating some master memo that people review once before a big investment committee meeting. So in a typical deal, we'll meet with a company. If we have a good first session, we will go back, we'll put together a due diligence list. We'll think through the areas that we want to due diligence. We've got a due diligence framework and scorecard that we sort of can eyeball and think about, okay, what matters in this opportunity, whether it's TAM, whether it's management team, whether it's getting under the hood and understanding the unit economics. And then it will be from a couple weeks to a month plus of due diligence and focusing on tackling the biggest areas of uh, that we need to get comfortable with to be able to do a deal. And throughout that, sharing that info with the team, developing, you know, we still have a memo. We do word-based written sort of paragraph memos then instead of like PowerPoint bullet point memos. We think that's better to communicate opportunities, but that process can last, uh, like I said, anywhere from a couple weeks to a month plus. And again, it's continuing to do the work, get through the due diligence items, and then get to that do we want to do this deal or not, rather than sprinting to some investment committee where it's one gate you have to get through. So I like it. I think it's much better because there's a bunch more decision nodes rather than there's a bunch more decision nodes in points in time where you can say, I want to keep doing work on this investment rather than, or I don't want to do work in this investment. And I think what it also may, allows us to do is we don't do a lot of work just to do work. If we're excited about an opportunity and well, I want to keep digging in, we keep doing work. And if we've decided that we want to pass, we can stop and move on to the next thing that versus feeling like we need to have a memo wrapped up so we can share it with the team and feel like we were getting credit for the work that we did. So hopefully that answered the, the question, Asif, but you know, that's a bit about how we think about the responsibilities and what the due diligence process looks like at a really high level. Yeah, no, I think that was a great response and understanding that VCN growth are dealing with oftentimes new and emerging industries, you have to be pretty dynamic. So it's not like private equity where there's only one way to do things. It's a, it's a constant conversation.
Exactly. And the due diligence you're going to do on investment, I think we touched on this a bunch of times, is different for every company, right? So the, the process can be a little bit different than that for each company and each industry you're looking at. Totally. Well, I think uh, that's uh, that's our time here at the top of the hour. Uh, we have a lot of still create questions in the chat. So is there a good way to contact you if there's any follow-up here? And I put the job application in the chat. And for everyone who attended the webinar, by the way, we'll send out a link to the job description and the role so they can apply further. But if there's any other questions, what's the best way to get them to you? Yeah, so I'm always an open door. So if anyone has any additional questions, you can email me. I'm alex at avp.vc. You can find email on our website as well, or Asif can even put it in the chat. But you know, please feel free to reach out. Always happy to answer questions and are really excited to be working with Asif and his team at Office Hours on this role we're hiring for. And I know he's posted the job link I and mean, you can find it on LinkedIn, but excited to hopefully talk to many of you on the webinar today as you know we look to build out our team. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for the time, Alex. I think this has been a great conversation, super informative. So we'll follow up with everyone here and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks you too. And thanks everyone for joining today. Bye. Awesome. See you.